The broadcast is now starting. All attendees can now hear you. Hello, everyone. This is Lino Tadros from Falafel Software, and uh, looks like we have a lot of people on the call. And for those of you on the West Coast, uh, good morning. On the East Coast, good afternoon. And for those in Europe and Australia, I'm really sorry to wake you up in the middle of the night. Um, I'm going to pick a name from the list right here just to make sure that everybody can hear me. So let's pick a name. How about Bill Anderson? Bill, can you actually uh, put something in the chat that says that you can hear me? Uh, or Brett Hoffman, any of you guys can just uh, put something in the chat that actually says um, that you will be able to uh, to hear me. All right, good. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, guys. This is great. All right, let's not get uh, 300 people doing that. No, I'm just kidding. All right, I'm going to actually share with you right now the fact uh, what we're going to go through for the next couple of hours. Um, if you can see my screen, hopefully you do, I have Visual Studio 2008 um, showing right there. And in the next actually couple of hours, we're going to go through 12 different um, samples. Uh, the samples here are written in C Sharp, but you can actually use the converter um, on the uh, Telerik website to convert all the files to VB if you'd like. Also yesterday, I have sent everybody um, the source code for everything, and also the courseware itself in PDF format. I know maybe 20% of you did not receive that because all your emails, if it was Gmail or uh, Hotmail or Yahoo, got rejected by these servers. Uh, and I'm sure um, Telerik will be putting the video, the source code, and the PDF on their website, and we will uh, make it available. And I'm sure uh, Todd Anglin actually will put it also on the uh, TelerikWatch.com website. So we'll be sending another message to tell everybody where everything is without having a zip file. That's why it got rejected, actually, from these servers. All right. So I uh, want to set the stage what exactly this uh, webinar is going to be all about. Um, this is an introductory to intermediate level uh, webinar for Red Grid View inside of WinForms. Um, the first three project that I have for you here, I'm going to do from scratch so you can see exactly how to use it in a design time environment. And once we get it nailed down how to use the design time uh, for the red grid view in Visual Studio, I'm actually going to go ahead and open up the rest of the projects um, automatically so we can actually spend more time on the code to get a better understanding of how to, to use uh, the red grid view to the max ability in the Telerik WinForms. All right, so um, so the first one, I'm going to go ahead and show everybody, if you're new to WinForms or Red Grid View, how to actually make a connection to a database. So let's go in here and close this solution. And I'm going to go ahead and open a new project. And we'll go to Windows C Sharp, uh, Visual C Sharp with Windows Forms application. Let's just create a simple app here just to show you how this is going to work. All right. With this uh, form here on the screen for Form 1, after you have installed the Telerik Red Controls for WinForms, the latest release, you can get actually the, uh, the trial, or if you own the, the, the product outright, you will have all these components on the left side in the toolbox for Visual Studio. Um, and I'm actually going to go ahead and find Red Grid View, which should be um, right there. So if I drag it and put it on the form right now, you will notice it will add some of the uh, Telerik assemblies in the references for the application itself. I'm going to go ahead and dock the entire red grid view to fill the entire uh, form. And there you go, there is a property called dock here. We'll click on the one in the middle to fill up the entire screen with that. And notice there is a smart tag right here, this little icon on the grid itself. If I open it up, you get all the different smart tags available for the red grid, for the red grid um, instead um, inside of there all right so first of all we want to set up connection to our database notice here it says choose data source and it's set to none if you bring this down uh, it's a little bit different than asp.net in winforms you need to create an add project data source if you click on that you can actually bring this data from a database from a service or from an object so in this case we're going to actually hook up the sql server and during by the way this entire uh, 12 different samples, 
we are going to um, be using Northwind or Adventure uh, Works. As a matter of fact, 11 of the 12 using Adventure Works. Only in one, I'm trying to use Northwind for simplicity, and I will let you know when that happens. All right, I'm going to go ahead and say OK on the database here. I'm going to say New Connection. I'm going to, I have SQL Server 2005 installed on this machine, so I'm just going to go ahead and say localhost, and I'm going to use my witness authentication, okay? If everything is okay, if I bring this in, uh, this combo box down, my database name that I'm going to use is AdventureWorks, and I can test my connection. Everything works fine, and I'm going to say okay there, all righty? Notice that the connection string is going to be saved, so you can actually confirm that this is the correct connection string. Once we say next, um, Visual Studio asks us if we would like to actually save the connection under AdventureWorks connection app in, uh, in app.config. We will say yes. And now we have access to actually run some, uh, choose some tables, some views, or actually store procedure, or even functions. In our case here, Let's go, for instance, and find uh, a table inside of the Adventure Works. And choose something like uh, contact person, for instance, okay? And that will choose all the fields of the contact person right away. And the data set that's going to be created for us will be Adventure Works data set. You can change the name here if you would like. I'm going to say finish. And at this point, as you can see at the bottom here, during the form designer, we will have the AdventureWorks data set got created and the contact binding source and table adapter that got created during, um, um, during that. I am going to go ahead and um, take a look at the grid. I'm getting actually uh, a nudge here um, that somebody is requesting a reduce uh, and a reduction in the resolution to display the text bigger. Um, I'm not sure I want to do that, unfortunately. I've been actually doing all the webinars uh, for a lot of different companies under this resolution, and it works very well for the video for everybody to see. Um, if you're not seeing this well on your machine, uh, probably uh, there's something else going on, but I have about maybe 11 different webinars done under this, and that will definitely mess up the video, so I really don't want to do that at this time. Um, so I'm not going to change it, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Uh, hopefully you can wait for the video when it comes out, and maybe you can see the screen better under different resolution or something like that. All right. So there is the screen here, folks. Um, I'm going to go back here and make sure that I am connecting to the database. Everything is looking good. So this is one of the first things that you will need to know how to hook up to a database, and we've just done that. Um, the important part now is actually to go to the uh, Open Property Builder, if I open open the property builder, in the new release, they have a very fancy property builder for red grid view. So, for instance, if I click on the red grid view in here, you see at design time, uh, not enough that I actually have the, uh, pro the property inspector here on the uh, right side of Visual Studio, I can all do all the stuff from the property builder itself, all right? So I can actually access all these different um, properties of the grid. Also, if I click on any of the fields, I can actually get straight into the properties of the field itself inside of this grid. So that actually makes it uh, very easy to manipulate. Of course, I can turn off some of the fields that I do not want to see, for instance. If I say I want to turn off some of these guys, um, contact ID, maybe I don't want to see visually on the screen. Uh, and if I do all the stuff, automatically you can see here in the preview how the whole uh, thing is going to show um, on the screen, all right? And I can actually make this uh, window a little bit bigger. I can turn off this guy as well. And uh, as you can see here, the preview, I can test everything inside of my property builder. Once you close this guy, you will automatically uh, pass this back to the grid itself on the actual form. If you ever want to test this application while in the middle of it, you can just go ahead and compile it and run it. So I'll say debug. Uh, start new instance, for instance. And there is my application happening right here. One of the things that actually um, is even nicer in the new release, um, I'm going to go ahead and drop, for instance, the Aqua theme. There is so many different themes that actually get installed. If I drop the Aqua theme anywhere actually on my machine in here, on my form, 
Uh, I can go back to my property builder and you will notice actually oops I'm sorry uh, in the uh, in the uh, smart tag itself there is theme name if I open this up notice that it actually added the aqua right there so if I click on aqua now it will change the theme automatically of my red grip to accept this theme there is a lot of different theme the desert theme and the miscellaneous theme that has the nice orange color and so on you can experiment with those by dragging them on the form and changing the theme of the red grid dynamically all right um, one of the things that you probably will need to do is actually set all these fields to be auto fit so that they don't truncate the names and that also can be done from the uh, property builder so if I go in here for instance to the grid uh, we look at the property for uh, uh, automatic auto fit master grid view right there and the master grid view hopefully will have the allow column auto fit Auto size column mode fill and there you go by doing that it will automatically um, assign the auto size column mode to auto fill the screen so if I run this again now hopefully um, the fields will look much better on the screen Alrighty, as you can see here, it actually made auto fit for all the uh, the different um, fields, and it should actually make it very easy to deal with the grid. And you can see now that it's using the Aqua theme as well. The another thing I wanted to show you actually here um, in the auto um, in the property builder is that you can definitely uh, go on a specific field. Let's say, for instance, we take something like a uh, a phone and you can actually go ahead and set the uh, connection uh, the format string and the format string is usually the last one in miscellaneous in here so if you have for instance something that contains an integer or money uh, uh, something that shows uh, an amount of value um, and I'm actually gonna go ahead and come in here and say colon C for instance for formatting P for percentages so you can do all the stuff on a specific field right inside from the property builder alrighty Alrighty, uh, I'm going to go ahead now and move to um, the next um, example. This is just to show you how to actually hook up to a connection string, maybe change the format strings, uh, use the property builder however you'd like, and uh, go from there. Alrighty, the next example, folks, I'm going to actually continue with that, how to add uh, more um, fields or more columns, um, whether visually or programmatically, to the screen itself. So let's say, for instance, um, I want to do this with a table. Let's go ahead and find a table that would allow us to do that. And that would be a salesperson, for instance. So let's go ahead and do this. I'm only going to create these projects only for the first three. And we'll drop the red grid one more time. You can fill, of course, the entire form with that grid. And in the red grid itself, I want to go ahead and hook up again to my data source. We'll do it really fast this time. I'm going to choose this connection. And in the table, we'll find something for the salesperson. And there is a salesperson right there. We'll bring in all its specific information. We'll say finish. And I can now bring up the property builder, fit in everything in the master view. There is my master grid view right there. 
and hopefully here we can actually have the outer size of the column equals to fill. And the, uh, the next step that I really need to do, as you can see here, uh, let's go ahead and turn off the row grid and the modified date. I don't need those. And um, notice that there's this button here that says new column. And new column, I can add whatever column um, in here. And if, for instance, let's go ahead and want to add visually a grid view decimal column, for instance. Um, so this is actually something that you need to be about. If you get this error, actually, it says please select a view before adding new columns. The thing is that the grid is still not selected in here, so you really need to click on the uh, on the grid here, or click actually on the grid in here, so that the uh, the button will actually be effective. So if I say view decimal grid view uh, decimal column here, um, what did I click? Oh, sorry. You have to click on the grid itself, uh, make it available, and then view the decimal column. Ah. Uh, what did I click on that is not correct? Ah, all right, so the salesperson binding source needs to be selected, or the grid itself somehow needs to be selected so that it knows where to be adding that spe uh, specific, um, um, the specific grid. So, as you can see here, the, the column has been added. And I'm going to go ahead and go to this specific new column, and I'm going to give it a unique name. Let's call it, for instance, percent quota, and give it uh, the name of the field will be percent quota again. And you can actually set the sort order, make it visible or not, however you'd like. I'm going to actually also make the, the middle center alignment for the specific one in here. So you can do all that kind of thing. One of the nice things I can do as well, because I know this is going to be a percentage, I can go to the format string, put column P, and that will show it in percentage automatically in the format string right away. All right, let's make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see it. Okay. So by looking at this, folks, I know that the percent quota will show up automatically inside of the grid. All right. Um, there is one more thing I need to maybe write an expression to uh, show how it's going to do the calculation right away. So let's go ahead and go to the code behind, for instance. Uh, double click in here. And there's my form, form load. And the form load, for instance, would go ahead and um, uh, write one line of code. And I'm going to go ahead and get that line of code for you in a second. I'm going to paste it from here. And there it is. And if I bring it over in here, do I control V? There it is. And this code actually will actually uh, go to the columns for percent quota expression and divide the sales uh, year to date by the sales quota. So that would automatically show up um, on the load of the form itself. All right. By the way, for this code to work, folks, you have to make sure that you're using the Telerik Win Controls UI. So let's say using Telerik Win Controls dot UI, and we can actually now go ahead and run this code. Uh, let's debug it and see what we can see. And there it is. There is a percent. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Oh. I should have made it fill to fill the entire form, but that's okay. As you can see here, the format string is a percentage, and it did the division between actually the sales year to date um, with the sales last year and so on, or commission point, whatever the, the, the quota was. So it shows you, based on the sales year, um, the division with the sales quota, what is the percentage of that, okay? So this is how simple it is to do it actually visually. By writing just one line of code, it will actually occur on your screen. One of the things that I wanted to show you also is how to, uh, to add this entire thing without using the property uh, builder, how to do it all in code um, automatically. So to do that, let me go ahead and bring in some more code. And instead of these two lines, make sure that you do not fill um, the adapter until actually you, you add the collection of, uh, of new fields. 
So let me go ahead and highlight this code and let the Visual Studio format it correctly. All right. No, it doesn't want to format it. Okay. We'll try this one more time. Okay, that's much better. All right, so if you can see here what I'm doing, folks, is that the red grid view, uh, I'm actually auto-generate columns equals to false. That means I want to do that myself after I'm going to do the fill after I actually generate specific columns. So for the columns for the percent coda, I'm doing the same line that you've seen before. And um, after that, I'm creating an instance of a checkbox column on the fly. And that check, uh, checkbox column uh, we'll give it a name, a unique name, of course, a header text, and the field name, whatever I want to call it. Give it a width, for instance, and then we'll, we'll add it to the uh, column collection of the red grid view itself. And then this is the important part. We will set, um, this should go on a new line. I'm actually pasting from the document itself here, so we need some formatting to make this uh, work just fine. There you go. Okay, that looks fine now. So um, this line here, folks, is how I'm going to actually add the uh, the new checkbox I, pro I created programmatically to the columns, and the expression will be whenever the percent quota is larger than 15. And remember, the percent quota is the one that I actually just added as well from right here. And then finally, I can do the fill on the entire data set, so I can actually manipulate um, the table adapter so it can show the data in the grid. If you leave the fill line that actually gets generated for you all the way at the top, usually you get an error message because that will not, will not actually uh, um, work. The, the collection of, uh, of fields is different than what actually you're trying to bring up on the screen. So hopefully you can see here that we added two fields. One, we did it with the property builder, and we just added the expression. And one, I added completely in code here to make this work. So let's go ahead and see how this one will work now. We'll debug this. And there it is. We added the checkbox to the grid. Okay. Let's make this a little bit smaller. And you will notice that all the different salesperson that actually um, are over 15% of their quota will have this checked automatically to true. Uh, and this field apparently, of course, does not exist in the database, so we're actually using it as if it was a calculated field. All right. Um, hopefully that gives you a pretty good intro on how to do these simple things. We're going to move to uh, um, better, bigger and better things now. All righty. And uh, the next one actually is the number three, lab number three on uh, page 15 for you uh, in the courseware. And that's actually how to do a grouping inside of uh, the red grid view. So let's go ahead and do a final new uh, project again. And this is the last one I'm going to start from scratch. I just wanted to spend the first three to show you how to do it. But after that, we'll just use the, uh, the code already available. All righty. We'll say OK there. And in this one, I'm going to use North Wind because it's uh, easier to actually do grouping with North Wind. So I'm going to bring in the red grid view one more time. And this time, we'll use the dock feature so that I can actually fill it for the entire form itself. And I'm going to use a smart tag to hook up to North Wind. So there is my database. And instead of this one, we're going to go ahead and say localhost in here. And this time, we'll hook up to Northwind. OK, test the connection. We're all ready to go. Say next. And now it's retrieving all the data from the database. And these are all my tables. So let's go ahead and find out, for instance, um, what would be a good table. Let's go ahead and use the customers table, for instance. Uh, where is customers? There you go. There is the customer table. We'll say finish there. And as you see at the bottom, as usual, we'll get the three different um, objects, the Northwind data set itself, the binding source for the customer table, and the table adapter that will fill in all that stuff. Let's go ahead and open up the property builder. And in the property builder, maybe I want to turn off some things. I will, select, I will unselect the customer ID. I don't need it. Regions, maybe I don't need it. 
um, I don't want to show phones or fax numbers. Uh, so these are good enough for me to be able to group on. And uh, another thing that is important for me to do, hopefully, um, for the master grid, like we've done before, is to go ahead and show the, uh, the fill on that. All righty. Now if I run this, folks, as is, I don't, without writing any lines of code at all, you will see how we can do the grouping automatically as built in to the red grid view for wind forms. So there is the, um, the form is going to show up. All righty, there is the application. And notice there is the gray area on top of the, uh, of the red grid view itself, and that's the area where you can drag and drop uh, specific fields to group by. For instance, countries, there is a lot of countries in here. For instance, let's see Mexico is here twice. So if I click on country and drag it and put it actually in this area, it will automatically um, group all the different countries. So if I go to Mexico, we notice there is multiple records in there. So if I open this up, you will see all the different records for Mexico right underneath there. Okay, so this is all done for you automatically and it's all done at runtime. The nice thing about it, of course, if you can take city and uh, drag city as well, city will actually now be a second grouping. So now if I go to Mexico, there is another group inside for Mexico DF, for instance. I can open that. Um, but some of these maybe will have multiple cities like Albuquerque and Anchorage and all that stuff. And you can open these and have multiple. So it's that easy actually to move these things by just dragging them and put them in the grouping area on top of the red grid. And that did not require um, um, somebody uh, will definitely have uh, to be able to do this on time wise. All right. What happens if you want to do this actually not at runtime, but you want to actually bring up the application automatically with the, uh, with the grouping set in the code? Because as you can see, if I close this and bring it back up again, there will be no grouping at all. Um, that's actually something you can do. If I close in here, you can actually go to your property builder, and the property builder will allow you to do this um, um, by choosing the group by column. Uh, for instance, we'll, let's go ahead and find out what that is. So if I click on this guy, I need to go to the master um, grid view that we've seen before. And there it is. Master grid view template is one of the most important thing actually in the red grid view because you will need to do a lot of things um, to the master view that you're seeing on the screen. Okay, And now I'm looking for something that says group by expressions. So once we find something that says group by expressions, I must be blind. Ah, there it is. Group by discretion. If I open up that dialog, I can add as many um, as many uh, grouping as I want at design time. That means when the application starts, we'll respect that right away. So we click on add the first one, for instance, and it, here the expression is ready to go. And it will be in between brackets. I can say country, for instance. Okay. And you will notice actually the code is available for you in the PDF. I'll say country as country. format, you can actually set the formatting in here by saying uh, 1 to actually uh, make the substitution for that. And we'll say group by, and we'll pass country again as the field that we want to group by. And you can decide if you want to do descending or um, ascending at the end. All right, so this entire line here, and notice what happens in the preview, it added country right there at the top right away. Um, you can actually go back and add more expressions for the city exactly the same way by actually adding the country as country or say city as city format and you can send uh, the group by and you can actually all say if you want to see them descending or ascending as well. So this is how simple it is to do it whether at runtime or you want to do it at design time in the uh, in the property builder. It's very easy to do the grouping. And the nice thing about uh, the way we did it right here with the group by expression is that when I run this code now, the application will start with this um, grouping done already for country. Okay? That doesn't mean that you don't have access to actually the, um, uh, release that grouping. I can click on it and drag it down and it will go away. So it's not like because if it's done in um, 
in design time in the property builder that will be stuck there, you still have the power, of course, to make all these changes if you'd like. All right. The, uh, the last part I wanted to show you in that example, what happens if you want to do this actually programmatically? So there's three ways to do it. At runtime, like we've seen, the property builder at design time, or based on a specific code written inside of your application, you can actually decide um, to make this um, uh, to make this available programmatically. So let's go ahead and write a little bit of code to show how to do this. I'm going to bring in a few lines of code. And that will happen. Uh, close this up, and I'm going to go to the code for this application. And here on the form load, for instance, I can write some code that looks like this. So notice what I'm doing here. I'm actually um, I'm deleting um, the second expression. So if I have country and city as two expression, of course the country will be at uh, group expression um, zero, and the second expression would be one. So if I actually enter the city already, this line will remove it straight from the uh, group by expression. And I can edit programmatically by having a line like this one. So I'm going to say group by expression dot add contact title as contact title, group by the contact title ascending. I didn't add the second one, so this line actually is not needed. I can just run this code, and it will automatically add that as the second one as well. So let's go ahead and run this and see how it will affect this in the code. All right, so now we have both of them, the contact title and the country. Notice that the country was added using the property builder, but the second one was added in code, as you can see in here, okay? All righty. So it's actually pretty simple. Once you get down to the syntax of how to add a group by expression inside of the red grid view, you can actually do this all day long, and it will be just fine already. At this point, hopefully you got an idea of how to uh, use the red grid view and being able to... Um, to set it to a data, um, data source for an object, uh, for a database connection. Uh, and I'm not going to be doing that again, so hopefully the first half an hour uh, we went through that three times for you to remember how to do this stuff. All right, so now I'm going to actually go back to my original project that, um, that you all got yesterday. And this one will say, um, oh, on the start page, there it is. And now I'm going to actually start uh, spending the time mostly on the code that I need to show you how to do these things. So, for instance, for sorting and filtering. Uh, so, for uh, sorting and filtering, you open this up. This application here, folks, is actually hooking up to the AdventureWorks. Um, this, uh, the most important part, of course, for filtering is that you need to enable this line for the filtering. And you would do that by actually clicking, for instance, on the, um, let me undock this guy. It's thinking about it. There you go. And there is the smart tag for the red grid. If I actually open up the property builder, you will notice that I can go to the uh, master grid view right there. And the important part for me is to find Enable Filtering, which turned off by default. And I actually turned it on here, which is not the default, so that I can do filtering automatically. So if you want to do filtering, uh, you will need to do that. Of course, all the properties for the master um, grid view is available um, uh, by code as well. All right. Um, another thing actually you need to be aware of for the sorting, um, if you can click anywhere on the headers, um, the first click will make it ascending, the second click will make it descending, but of course all that stuff can be done at design time by setting the, um, the sort order itself. Alrighty, so if I look in here, Sorting expressions, 
we'll look at sorting expressions right there. There you go. There's the collection for the sorting expressions. So if I open this up, notice there is one for descending for the reorder point, but I can add as many as I want. And based on the order in here, maybe it will automatically do the sorting descending on the first, and then the second sorting will happen maybe on the name. So it will respect the first one, and then it will respect the second one as well to actually um, sort on the second element the name after inside of the reordering point itself. Okay, so you don't have to do this in design time. You can actually, as I said, at runtime time, you can click on the on the headers of your red grid, and the uh, and the whole thing will be done for you automatically. All right. Um, at this point, uh, I'm going to show you a line of code also how to do this part programmatically. So let's go ahead and open up the code. Let's see view code. And uh, right here, if you look at this line right there, that says the red grid view master grid template dot sort expression dot add, there's a field there called color, and I can sort on that um, color field ascending way. So as I said, every time you look at the red grid, you can do things visually, the property builder way, or programmatically, and they all will end up being exactly the same thing. For filters, um, as I said, by enabling filter equal to true, you will automatically have in the UI ways for you to um, um, to run this code, like in here in sorting and filtering. If I run this code, I'll show you how to do it visually. And the way you're seeing it is only with one line of code to say enable filtering equal to true. And that will show up this, uh, r this row right here. So if I want to actually go to name, for instance, in here, and I can actually enter B, and I can bring uh, something to start with. If there is anything that starts with B inside of name, it would have shown in here. So let me delete that. And let's say something that starts with L. Uh, we'll put an L in here. And there is three in L. You can say start with, ends with, equals, if it's a, an integer or something like that. Or if it contains, if there is an L, it will show up automatically in here. As you can see, it's pretty fast and it works pretty well as well. Alrighty, and um, so what happens, folks, if I want to actually do this filtering programmatically, which a lot of times this is what you would probably want to do. Yeah. So uh, just choosing visually, entering an L and saying uh, contains or start with is great, and I'm sure you're going to use it a lot. The most important part is that can I do this stuff programmatically? And the answer, of course, is yes. As you can see here for the column, we have a column called make flag. If I say dot .filter, now I'm actually causing an expression on the um, column itself for make flag. And there is a couple of things that you would want to make sure you understand how this works. There is actually a binary operation um, um, object that is available for, for, for the filter expression. So I can um, new a new instance of the filter expression and use an AND binary operation and say grid known function dot equal to, and you will have all the different fun um, uh, available values for the grid known functions for equal to, greater than, equals, contains, starts with, all these are available under the grid known function. And the value will be true. Okay, so you want to find out all the different uh, make flag fields that are actually set to true. The next one is a little bit more complicated. These three lines go together and it's using predicates for the filter. Um, which is some kind of a delegate, as you probably know if you are familiar with C-sharp. So these red grid view columns for product number, for instance, these are all happening on the product number. I'm creating a new expression, a filter expression called the product number, and I'm actually looking for anything inside of the, the product number field that starts with a C or an R. So as you can see, the binary operation is an OR here, and I'm using the start with grid known function, and I'm passing C and R in the two different functions in here. So you can actually add more and more predicates to a specific filter to actually say if it's C or an R, and if it starts with this and contains that, you can actually keep going like this forever with all the binary operation ORs and ANDs to, do, to make this uh, work. Of course, it's much simpler to do it at runtime, uh, but uh, I think it's important also to know how to do this at design time, uh, programmatically as well, so you can actually make this work. All righty. Hopefully that uh, made sense to you. Um, and uh, we'll keep going. All right, the next one is the hierarchy designer. The hierarchy designer is actually um, 
a pretty nice application to take a look at. Why would you use actually the uh, the hierarchy design? A lot of people, especially um, by the way, this is a new feature to uh, to the new version of uh, of Red Grid View. A lot of people have asked for this. What happens when you actually don't want to show uh, related data, but you want to show hierarchical data that sometimes do not even relate to each other? Uh, so there is a lot of companies out there that have been having this feature in their grids, and uh, I'm very glad that uh, Telerik have actually included this feature for hierarchy view, and it's also available for the ASP.NET version as well, which uh, can be very, very useful. All right, so let me show you how that would work. Um, so this is regular red grid view. What I did in here, I actually I went to the theme, and there is a theme here called miscellaneous theme. By dropping this miscellaneous theme, folks, you can actually go to the theme name, and you're using Vista Orange. All right, you can use Vista Telerik or any of the other colors coming from that. And I thought that was a pretty one to show, it's using orange and blue colors uh, with a background of black. And in here, I want to open up the code to show you what we've done for the hierarchies for this to work. So we'll see the view code. There is really not much happening. Um, you can do this visually very simply by actually going back to the designer and going in here. You will notice that we actually chose a data source for the depart uh, department, and there is another um, uh, table other than department is called employee department history inside of um, AdventureWorks. So AdventureWorks have two tables. Uh, you can follow this on page 25 in the courseware. You will see that uh, department and employee department history are related by department ID. And instead of actually just showing the first level of headers of the main red grid view, I can show a hierarchy between the two different um, grids inside of each other. And that can actually all be happening based on the property builder. I can do all the stuff from here from the property builder. Notice that the, the most important thing for you to do is to assign who's going to be the uh, the main grid and which one is going to be the child grid. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do that. In the master grid view. Let's bring this up. There it is. In the master grid view here, folks, I am going to go to the child grid view template. This is the most important part. Remember, the grid already knows that it's hooking up to um, the department table. Okay? So if I go to grid child view template and open up that collection, I can actually add a new item like I did in this example. And inside of this example, in the data source, when I open it up, you will notice that I need to go to my project data source, go to where the data set is, and this is the only place where you're going to see the the, uh, the main department table and also the employee department history. At this point, click on the employee department history right there. And once you do that, uh, this table will be actually uh, the data source for the grid view template as a child of the grid itself. So the most important thing to remember here, when you open up the project data source, go click on the data set, and the data set will contain all the tables inside of the data source. Okay? Click on the child one that you want to use as a child grid view inside of there, which is the employee department history right there. Okay. Other than that, there is really nothing uh, you need to uh, to do to make this work. Just it will automatically um, assign itself and make it work. All right. Let's see if there is anything else I can tell you about this specific one. Um, no, the source is fine. All right. So now that I set the grid uh, view and the main grid for the grid itself, um, one of the things that it needs to know how it's going to actually link these two um, parent and child relationship. So you will notice there is something all the way at the bottom here, hopefully it's called the relations. If I click on collections, the ellipsis button, you will notice that I can create a relation. This would be empty when you do this for the first time. I actually went ahead and created my own relation. And these actually five different miscellaneous properties are very important. You will need, first of all, to set the child template. Child template, you need to make sure that the grid view template that we just set is your child template. Okay? And then you're going to go to the parent template and make sure that the main grid is the main uh, parent template for the entire grid. Then we're going to go back to the parent and child column 
and you're going to create a collection for each and every one of them and you're going to add this specific editor and we're going to call it department ID. This is not something you're going to be able to use a, a drop down list to choose from. You're going to have to enter the name of the field that you want to actually link the two parent and child grids together on. So you're going to actually have to enter this manually for department ID. Alrighty? And then we're going to do the same thing with the parent column name. Enter exactly the same department ID here as well. All right, you relation name, give it whatever name you want. This can be whatever you want, and that will be the name of the relationship. Uh, after that, folks, there is really nothing to be done. You can actually run your application, and it should be in a pretty good shape. So let's go ahead and do that for number five. We'll close this guy, and let's see if this works. All right, so there's the application. As you can see, it has pretty nice colors. The selected one will be in blue. The rest will be having a little bit of maroon color. And I can actually now click on the plus sign anywhere on the master grid itself. And I can see the hierarchy um, with different kind of um, headers for the, the inside grid view that is showing inside of there. And that was done only by using the property builder. There was no code written in there whatsoever. Okay, so um, that was definitely a nice thing to do. Um, the continuation actually in lab six, as you can see here, is how to actually do it automatically without even using all the stuff that we did in the uh, property builder. There is a way just to tell it that I'm going to be using um, the hierarchy uh, and just give it a data set. And from the data set, it will find out what the relationship between the two is. Okay, so we'll close this down. We'll open up the... Uh, the number six all right there it is so how we do that from actually the data source in here okay um, instead of actually telling the grid um, which table I want to get to it would be uh, much easier to go uh, to the um, to the project data source itself right here and click on the adventure works data set okay so instead of telling the grid hey um, I have a specific table I want you to get the information and the metadata and the records from if you click on work adventure works data set right here which I've done already for you in this example um, this adventure work data works contains the product vendor and the vendor table there is two tables here Remember in the previous example, in number five, I had to set specifically to grid to one of the tables, and then I had to create a child um, grid view, and then have to hook up the two with the specific uh, relations, um, and all that stuff had to be done manually in the property builder, which makes sense. But uh, if you want the system to actually do all that stuff for, for you, instead of actually choosing one of the tables, just click on the AdventureWorks dataset itself, and that's the secret for how to get the... Uh, the Telerik red grid view to do the entire relations for you without you having to, to set anything up. Okay, so if you do that, that will automatically generate a hierarchy in the data set um, in here, right there. Edit and designer right away. It will create this for you and it will find out that it can actually relate between the two, between vendor ID and vendor ID on the two tables. So you don't need to really enter anything at all. The data set is smart enough to be able. Um, to make this information um, work, okay? All right, so I just wanted to remind everybody that for this example number six, we did not add anything to the property builder or any code at all. Um, we just had to point to the correct data set instead of the table, and it did all the stuff for us automatically. All right, let's make sure it still works as everything else. And there it is. It's looking up to brand new tables. I can click on any of these and I can be able to see actually the content as a separate grid completely. And the Telerik Red Grid was able to figure out how to do all that stuff right away. All right. So the, the only thing left for us to do is how can we do all the stuff that we did in number five and six all programmatically. And um, that would be definitely a good thing to do. It would definitely require some code to be written. But everything we have done visually, whether it's in the property builder or, um, 
who are actually doing it using the uh, automatic assignment inside of the red grid I can do all the stuff automatically in uh, code so let's go ahead and take a look at what the code would be so this is a decision that you probably would have to come up with whether you want to make these decisions of actually joining different tables together and showing the hierarchy programmatically or not so let's go ahead and view this in the code all right I know there is a little bit more of of code written in here but actually it does make sense uh, what exactly we're trying to do in here and hopefully it would make sense to you as well uh, first of all in the form itself I'm actually creating three different variables and one of them is the data set itself and the other two are the two um, table adapters for the salesperson and the sales territory from the database so although we did create actually the database and a connection to uh, to the adventure works I'm actually not setting the data source of the grid right now the grid uh, source is none so as you can see here the choose data source is none that means I'm gonna do all my the work myself to set the master and the child of this red grid and do the hierarchy all myself in the code so by actually having two variables for the table adapters for the two tables and the data set itself notice in my code in here I have two uh, small pieces the constructor for the form itself will set some things up after the initialized component that gets written for you automatically we'll go ahead and create an instance of the adventure works data set and for the two table adapters I'm actually getting back the, the data set from the table adapters to fill in these two instances of the objects of the table adapters as well uh, finally in the load of the form itself I have four different pieces of code each one does something separate the first one sets the data source for the sales territory notice here we're setting all the auto size column mode to fill I'm choosing a theme um, the master grid view template allow add new role is false so I of course if you want to implement add new rows you can actually write some more code so you can actually set this up uh, the way you want to but I'm actually turning that off here just to make it a read-only grid just to show you how to do this really fast um, and I'm actually uh, sending uh, setting the row grid the row GUID uh, to be invisible on the screen next I'm actually creating dynamically as you can see here a new grid view template for the child uh, template that I want and I'm actually still getting a different table which is a salesperson to be the data source for this new child grid okay I'm also setting the uh, auto size column mode to to be filled and um, I'm also allowing um, not allowing uh, new records to be added alrighty the red grid view master grid view template the child grid view template dot add so the nice thing is that every single master grid um, can actually add a whole new template for that grid automatically by using the add for the collection all right um, and after that I'm actually setting the relation in code as you can see in here so everything we've done previously can all be done programmatically by creating a, um, a grid uh, view template and then setting up the relationship by creating a new instance of the relation object and setting everything we've done before in code okay and um, and that's actually all that needs to be done uh, once you fill the two adapters the grid will automatically um, show the data correctly in the database in, in the inside of the uh, the telegrid grid view right away so let's make sure that this code actually still works we'll stay debugging here and that code hopefully will fire up on the load and if everything goes well there is our grid that was actually data source equals to none right now showing all this information uh, automatically based on the uh, the runtime code that ran based on my explicit um, grid view template for the child for, and for the relation itself as well all right let's go ahead now and uh, take a look at uh, some other things other than the hierarchy whether it's in code or automatic or in the designer uh, let's take a look at the virtual mode for instance what does virtual mode mean let me bring this up show you the code for that so virtual mode here folks um, really means uh, being able to display information inside of the grid itself uh, maybe not coming straight from a database and being able to change the view on the master grid template itself dynamically at runtime so let's see for instance what I have here 
Uh, first of all, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, right here the data source is none. That means my virtual mode um, number eight here, lab number eight, is not showing anything at all. It's not hooked up to anything. So let's go back to the code. Notice that I have three uh, private members actually of the class here for the form itself. Um, you will need to decide how many rows you want to see and how many columns you want to show in there. And I'm also creating a generic for a list of a contact table. I don't know if you uh, are starting to see what I'm trying to do. I'm going to actually go ahead and hook up to um, Adventure Data Works for the contact table. But instead of showing the contact table straight in the grid, I'm actually going to manipulate the contact table itself and um, make it part of a list. And because iList or iBinding source are all interfaces that the Red Bridge View and, and the Teleric uh, component set will automatically be able to bind to, I'm going to tell it to actually go ahead and bind to my list, not straight to the database. All right. This is something probably you would want to do in your code as well for your application that you're developing. And um, um, and we'll go ahead and do that. All right, so let's go ahead and see what we do in the constructor after the initialize component call that gets called for you automatically. We're going to actually turn off all the add new row and cell context menu and delete row and edit row and all that stuff. Again, if you want to implement all the add new row and whatever, you can definitely do that. You just have to write a little bit more code to enable all the stuff. I'm actually disabling <coughs> sorting, filtering, and grouping and all that good stuff in there. All right. So inside of the constructor, folks, I'm going to have a for loop that goes through the entire 20 rows that I actually decided on here. And I'm actually add that to my contact table dot add. And I'm going to add all different columns for my contact table. OK. And right now they're all empty. I just needed like a placeholder for my contact table um, row for the specific constructor. All right, so that is my refresh contact data that will get called for me automatically, um, hopefully on a timer. I don't know if you notice or not. I actually have a timer here that is actually set to um, it is actually set to every 100 millisecond. So it will uh, fire up uh, 10 times every second uh, to show the data inside of the grid itself. So what is important about the refresh contact data? Um, there is a class called random that you can instantiate to get the, uh, the tick count on the CPU speed on your machine so you can get a real um, so you can get a real um, random number every time instead of actually uh, being stuck with probably the same random number and now you can actually use a random class to say next 1000 that means choose a number between 0 and 1000 and that will be your index that you would like to to uh, to start with um, it will initialize actually the adventure works data set and we'll get the uh, we'll pass the index inside of that inside of the for loop and we'll fill in the contact table as you can see in here coming back from the data set uh, first name last name email address and phone okay and the nice thing about this folks is that the data set can be 30,000 different records okay and I'm actually limiting that to actually go get me the database on number of rows 20. So you can implement that for paging, you can implement that however you want to go get data really fast and manipulate it yourself for speed. So if your grid is taking a long time, for instance, because you're bringing half a million records, you can implement it this way so that you can um, really manipulate what gets shown and you do kind of some caching and it can actually be extremely uh, viable solution to actually make your application scream as far as speed. Okay. Uh, on the load of the form itself, there is a couple of things happening in here. Um, some of them are very important to mention. Um, other than filling the adapter, this line here is important. Uh, there is an event that I need to uh, to implement actually, which is the cell value needed. So every time the grid needs to fill a cell and it needs to get the value for it, this specific event will need to be triggered. And you notice that I implemented all the way at the bottom in here by getting the e dot value and giving that to the contact table that I created earlier, passing the row index and the column index right here. So every time the grid needs to fill up a value, this event will be called. So make sure the code that you have in here is some of your fastest code available uh, to make sure that this does not take time. So this is not the place to actually write novels, okay? So cell value needed hopefully uh, will be uh, very fast code for you because it will get triggered a lot in the rendering of the grid itself. 
as you can see on the load here, after we do the filling and we actually uh, start the, the event for the cell value needed, we are going to call uh, refresh contact data, which happened right before that. Other than that, it's a matter of actually uh, telling the grid that it's actually in virtual mode. So we'll say red grid view that virtual mode equal to true. Now it knows that it needs to load that stuff uh, from a, a virtual mode. Um, and it, we will tell it what the number of columns are and we will give it all the names of the headers. We are really setting the visualization right now of the red grid. Okay? And at the end of the load, we're going to start our timer. As I said, it will, uh, it will trigger every 100 millisecond. And what does that do for us every time the ticker happens, every 100 millisecond? It will do a grid.element.update and it will call the batch data change. So every time data changes inside of this grid, which it will, as you can see here, based on a random number, the refresh data, uh, contact data will automatically change every time. So what I'm trying to do in here to show you how fast the grid is going to actually uh, redraw itself every 100 millisecond, all the cells will be read again from scratch because this data will, will change randomly every 100 millisecond. Okay, so this will happen 10 times per second. So let's go ahead and run this code and let me show you the speed um, of something like that, how it can work. Hopefully over go to webinar you'll be able to see what's happening. And it's going to start. And if you can see what I'm seeing here, you would notice that uh, 10 times per second this grid is running to automatically um, choose different data coming from 0 to 1000 from the data set to be able to show you specific data. So it actually works pretty well. Um, and it actually, um, the performance, there is no flickering um, once you run this example from your code uh, that I've sent, you will be able to see all the stuff happening for yourself, all right? So everybody understand what virtual mode is all about? Virtual mode is about not hooking up to the database directly, being able to get this data and cre create some kind of an intermediary between you, uh, the data and the grid itself so you can have more power over the grid uh, rendering speed and the amount of things that can actually show up in the grid, not based on the data set size itself. All right. The next example will be binding. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at the binding example. As you can see for the binding here, I uh, also have data source equals to none, but you'll notice there is a class that I created in the binding example and it's called salesitem.cs. Let's open up this file and see what's inside of there. I created a class and it, inher it inherits from a very uh, specific class called inotify property changed. I gave it three properties that I'm going to need, name, price, and time, and the constructor will fill them in. Even price have actually uh, a format string available right there. The important behind this class, not only that it has three properties, it actually implements the iNotify property change interface. That means it will have to have these two things implemented. The event for property change event handler has to be implemented, property changed, and the on property changed uh, handler itself will have to be implemented by passing the property name as you can see in here. So it's not a lot of code or anything like that, but um, hopefully you, you understand once you want to descend a class from this I notify property changed, you have to implement these two uh, to make them available um, in your class itself. All right, so it's a very simple class sale item, um, and I can create a bunch of those sale item objects with uh, by passing the name, the price, and the time, and they will notify um, the property name that something changed, if anything changed inside of there. All right, so let's now go back to the code of this application and show you what exactly I've done to make this work. And by the way, the idea behind this uh, binding number nine lab here uh, is to show how you can bind to something that is not database related at all. So I'm actually creating my own class. And uh, how does Red Grid, for instance, um, can receive data from something other than a database? Again, uh, you will notice that this line here, anything that is an, an, uh, an implementation of the iBinding list, the Red Grid view knows how to bind to that automatically. So as long as you make your sales item look like an iBinding list, you should be in a good shape. So there is a, the private member called uh, sales item of binding list of type sales item for this generic. Um, once I now go ahead and create sales item.add and I create, I hard-coded uh, 10 different 
elements here for the sales item once those actually get created automatically they will take the shape of an I binding list that means red grid view now can bind to the sales item automatically and it will show them as if it was coming from a database for instance all right so uh, what uh, what I wanted to show you is that the, on the load of the form, I'm going to load the data. So all these data will be available in the sales item. Ten items will be in there. And I'm going to set the data source automatically to sales item. You see, there's no database. I'm actually hooking up the sales the data source automatically to an I binding source right away. And I'm going to turn off the add new role false. Uh, auto generate columns is true. Auto size columns mode equals filling. And I'm going to start the timer. So what do I want to show you about this timer? Although I'm actually hard coding 10 elements in here, I just wanted to show you based on every second or so, um, I wanted to, um, to go ahead and choose the top item in the list, remove it, and then create a new item with a new timestamp, for instance, and add it to the bottom of the list. So um, the item here is being removed from the top, but adding, but adding it back at the bottom with a new timestamp. Okay? So if I run this code, here on the binding notice the first record um, is showing actually the whole grid is showing the data from the sales item but every half a second or so it's taking the top element and adding it all the way to the bottom okay I mean that's not the important part the important part is that we are binding to something that is not database and it's actually I binding uh, source element you can do this with an I list, I binding list, I binding source. All these are interfaces that, if they are implemented, it will automatically um, bind to a red grid view by having one line of code, as you can see in here, uh, that says red grid view dot data source, and equals to the uh, the instance of the class that implements these interfaces. Alrighty, all right. Uh, I'm going to actually go now um, for number ten, which is dynamic link library. Um, if you're using the link implementation, let me open this up to show you what I mean. This is a grid right here, folks, the red grid in, uh, in WinForms, that has also the data source equals to none. If you would like to use the grid to get information from the database um, using the link implementation from .NET 3.5, you can do that. You need to go to uh, the Microsoft website. And inside of your uh, PDF that I sent you, it has the link there where to go to the Microsoft website. And you need to download a file called dynamic.cs. By just adding dynamic.cs to your project, dynamic.cs is a pretty big file coming from Microsoft. As you can see here, it's copyrighted by Microsoft. And it actually creates a namespace called system.link.dynamic. Just for you to be able to use iQueryable to be able to use, for instance, things from Telerik, like uh, the Telerik Red Grid View, um, to automatically use link iQueryable um, functionality from the code to assign um, results to the Red Grid View automatically. And there is a reason why you want to do something like that. It's because of the speed. Again, when you have 50 or 100,000 um, elements inside of your database, using link will actually make it a lot faster to concentrate on the um, specific record set that you want to show in the grid at a time. So you can implement paging, you can implement the speed of actually going from filtering and sorting and all that stuff much, much faster using link than actually going straight to the database. And I'm going to show you that in the code in a second here. So in this example here, folks, um, I'm going to hook up to the AdventureWorks, and I actually do have 30,000 records in the database, in the table that I'm going to hook up to right now. The issue is that I want it to work as fast as possible. So I'm going to be deciding how many records I want to see in the grid. Okay, so I'm going to maybe say here 100. And then I'm going to set up the sort by and whether I want it ascending or descending. And once I click on sort, I should see the 100 records right here. But there will be no data set coming back from the data set uh, from the database containing the whole 30,000 rows. Okay, so let me show you what I mean here in the code. This is a good thing. This is all the code necessary for this entire application to work, which is definitely a very good thing. Um, first of all, 
uh, you will need to actually start the grid element of the grid by saying begin update. So the whole thing looks like a transaction between begin update and end update. The reason why you want to do that is because you do not want anything uh, to change the red grid view um, while you're in the middle of this transaction. So this will actually um, hold everything off and will not make any updates to the red grid view until you, you end the update for the grid element itself. Inside of the code, I will create an instance of the iQueryable and I will go uh, against the sales order header data class data context. Where is this guy coming from? When I hooked up to the database, you will notice I uh, can go say file, uh, new, and in the new file here, I can actually choose, where did it go? No, that's not it, file. new item. Yeah. If I right-click on the project and say file new item, what you're looking for here is linked to SQL classes. So if I click to link to SQL classes, it will create a DBML file for me. Once I create that DBML file, you will end up with a file that looks like this. Okay? And how to actually make this happen? You can actually open the server explorer, go to whatever table, for instance, I'm using here sales um, order header, and sales order header should be somewhere in here. There you go. By clicking on this guy and dragging it straight to the surface in here, it will generate this DBML representation of the table. You can have as many tables as you want, and you can um, you can make joins between them and so on. The DBML automatically will know how to create the um, the link code for it behind the scene for that. Um, so it's all visual. There is not really much code to write here whatsoever. The important part is once you do that. I'm going to actually call into that data context that just got created for the sales order header dot s queryable. That means this queryable um, instance will contain actually um, the preparation to go against the sales order header. This line of code here, folks, does not go get me the 30,000 lines of code, uh, lines of uh, data from the database. This just makes sure that it knows where to go to get the data once once I need it. And that's one of the nice things about Link. It actually waits till you absolutely need the data to go ahead and actually do that. And then I'm going to use the query rule again to order by um, the field text that I'm actually choosing from the UI. And finally, I'm actually going to use the data source right here to do a queryable dot take. Take is actually a link um, command that actually uh, gives you whatever number you're passing in here. If I pass 10, for instance, queryable.take returns the top 10 of that. If you push 100 in here, it will only give you 100. So this is the first time the query will actually have to be executed. So it will not execute on this line. It will just be prepared and knows where to go get the data when it's needed. So when I say take 100, this is the only time we'll go against the 30,000 records and we'll bind the grid view to a data source coming from the 100 records only coming back. Once I end the update, this code will be extremely fast. So hopefully you can see how you can implement link against huge uh, data sets to make the performance of the grid extremely fast. You can implement, of course, the paging of the red grid based on the same methodology here um, to make it extremely fast. Okay. So let's go ahead and run this guy. And let's say debug run in here and see what we get out of link for that. Of course, you have to have .NET 3.5 running for you to use this. So I'm going to come in here and let's say 100, for instance, and the sort by here. I, um, all these I entered myself in the, in the collection of the combo box. I'm going to say by order date, for instance, and we'll do descending. How about that? If I click on sort now, it will go back to the database, as you can see in here, and now I have 100 records from the whole 30,000 available in the grid, and I can manipulate them however I want. I can tell the grid that I want to actually turn on um, editing and updating and adding new rows, and I can uh, treat it exactly the same way I would treat any other database. Uh, the only difference is all the communication between you and the server are going through the link provider here um, instead of going straight to the database. And that, for speed, that can actually be a very good thing. Alrighty? Alright, let's go ahead and uh, do the last two uh, exercises as well. A lot of people ask for how to do Excel exporting. 
uh, and also Telerik reporting exporting from inside of the red grid view. So I'm going to actually show you how to do that. The first one, number 11 here. All right, so in this one, folks, there is uh, two buttons in here. One that will export actually whatever inside of the red grid view uh, into an Excel PIA. PIA stands for uh, um, uh, Primary Interop Assembly. What does that mean? That means Excel has to be installed on the machine because it's going to use the primary interop assemblies using COM behind the scenes to export all the stuff against the automation server for Excel itself. So if you have Excel, you are guaranteed, of course, that will work. So what is this uh, using Excel ML? Excel ML is actually another feature in the red grid view that you would be able to export all the uh, what's available inside of the red grid view at this point to an Excel spreadsheet, an XLS file, without actually having to have Excel installed on that machine. And that is a very important point as well. So although it will create an XLS file on your hard drive, it will not need you to have Excel installed to actually create it. Of course, it, you need Excel to view the file, but for creating the file, you will not need Excel. So you get to choose whether you want to use the Excel ML way or the Excel PIA way, and the code is available for this example for both of them. Uh, for this example, for instance, I'm hooking up here, as you can see, to um, to Adventure Works using the contact um, person. So there is a contact table in here. And to show you the code, first of all, the export file here, you will need to choose an XLS file on your hard drive where you want it to actually uh, get installed. And uh, once you click on export this one or this one, it will take this information and do that. So let's see, for instance, first of all, the PIA, how is that code written to do this? There is the uh, Excel PIA click. Um, the, if the uh, TB file name.txt is not an empty string, and that's actually the last check bo uh, um, edit box on the screen that shows um, what's the name of the file, this one here. This is um, going to be the file that you're exporting to. And you can do all the stuff with three, with actually two lines of code here, folks. It's very easy. You can create a red grid view Excel exporter, give it an instance of exporter, and create an instance of this guy. And then use the instance exporter to export from the red grid view based on the uh, file name that you want to save to and tell it which sheet you want to actually add that to, whether it's sheet 1, sheet 2, or whatever sheet name you have inside of the Excel spreadsheet. Um, so believe it or not, with these two lines of code, you will be able uh, to save the entire grid uh, automatically into an Excel spreadsheet with these two lines of code. Of course, again, this code will only work if you have Excel installed on that machine. So let's see the other code. What happens if Excel is not installed on the machine? I still want to create an XLS file. So we will also check if there is a, an Excel file. Uh, um, and the, uh, I'm sorry, an Excel file name available in the UI there. And now I'm actually adding some more nifty stuff to show what uh, we can do with conditional formatting objects. So conditional formatting objects coming from the Telerik Win Controls UI assembly. And I can say highlight, condition type starts with 396, um, passing it true in here. Uh, what I'm seeing in here is that um, I'm going to be passing C1 to the phone columns. So any phone number inside of the list in the red grid view that starts with 396, I want to highlight the entire line in yellow before I export it to the ML. That means in Excel, all uh, record that have phone numbers starting with 396 will be highlighted in yellow. Okay? Um, this is just an extra thing uh, just to show you how to do conditional formatting. The real code is very simple. It's also line, two lines of code right there. Creating an export to Excel ML, and again, that is coming from the Telerik Win Control UI export assembly. Once you create an, uh, an instance of the Excel ML exporter, you can say run export, passing the red grid view, give it the name of the file you want to save to, and uh, export to Excel ML dot Excel maximum rows. This is something built into the uh, the instance of the export to Excel ML itself. Um, un uh, underscore six five five three six is the maximum rows that you can have in Excel. So no matter how many rows you have in the red grid view, as long as it doesn't exceed that, um, we will be just fine. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and take a look exactly how this stuff is going to work. I'm going to right click on the export in here and we'll let it run.
and there is my data grid there is actually a lot of data inside of here um, my best bet actually just to show you uh, pretty simple stuff I'm gonna actually go to last name for instance and put a B in here and I'm gonna say uh, starts with B so now I filtered my entire grid to start with B's and now I'm gonna export to a file and let's say for instance I'm gonna go to my C drive right there and we'll call this file uh, telerik.xls file okay so if I say telerik.xls and save that now I know where this is going to be exporting to now I can click on this export button here and if I've done this correctly hopefully it's actually using the uh, the uh, uh, the PIA to talk straight to the COM engine of Excel to do that so if I go to my machine here hopefully go to the C drive and try to find a Telerik on the C drive. Where did it go? C colon backslash Telerik. Ah, it's still working on it. Hopefully, in a second, we'll be able to get um, the um, Telerik that Excel has created on this drive. And I want you to notice that actually using the COM. Uh, to go through PIA it takes a definitely a little bit longer to do that. Um, uh, welcome to COM. It just takes a, a while to do this stuff. The other one will be much, much faster um, to do the Excel ML. Not only that, it will actually highlight all the four numbers that start with 396 in yellow, and then we'll pass that to Excel as well. All right. Yeah, I know this one takes a little bit of time. And... Um, I should have started with the ML one, but hey. <laughs> I can see my actually my hard drive is uh, is going heavily, um, so it's actually creating the export. Definitely takes time through the com layer. All right. All right, maybe just because of the essence of time, because I have less than eight minutes before we start taking questions, I'm going to actually kill this guy. And I'm going to run it again and show you the other way, which is much faster. But after a while, this will come back and it would have created the, uh, the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you can try this on your machine and be patient with it, and it will be just fine. All right, so there it is. I'm going to export this guy, let's say, to uh, Telerik ml.xls file we'll say save there and let's also give it a smaller data set b starts with and now I'm going to click on the export in here and hopefully that will happen uh, very fast and it says the export completed so it's much much faster to use Excel ML so if I go in here folks notice that the Excel ML is there and it's a one and a half meg Where's a file that was very fast to actually create that and if I double click on it I'm going to bring up Excel it actually shows up on my other machine but I'm going to bring it down for you in here hopefully you can see it notice that all the data is in here and every time there's a phone number that starts with 396 it is actually highlighting the entire line in yellow so we keep going down there's a lot of data in this file and we'll see another one the 396 it's in yellow as well okay so this is how simple it is, two lines of code to send it to an Excel spreadsheet, whether you use the PIA method or the ML method, they're both available for you. All right, the final example, folks, it's, uh, we're going to finish exactly on time. We have only five minutes left, and then we're going to start taking questions. And did I hear close down? Ah, shame on me, I closed down. Visual Studio. All right. There we go. And the last example here is actually how to use exactly the same exporting mechanism, but instead of sending it to Excel, to go ahead and send it to Telerik reporting. Of course, that will only work if you have Telerik reporting installed on the machine as well. So I'm going to go ahead and open up 
uh, this example. As you can see in here, the grid itself. We'll go ahead and take a look at the data source for that. And notice that it's actually hooking up to the product vendor uh, table inside of AdventureWorks. Okay? So I want to see what this Generate button does. First of all, I have to be very clear with you about something. You will notice here in my project number 12 for exporting to Telerik reporting, in the references, uh, other than the usual Telerik um, assemblies that will be added to references, there is something called the Red Grid Reporting Lite. This is actually a DLL that is available on the Telerik forums and if you have my PDF that I sent yesterday, you have the link of where to go get it from. Um, you will actually have to have this Red Grid Reporting Lite DLL installed as a reference inside of your example, so that from a WinForms application, you can send the data straight to a Telerik reporting um, window. Okay? Uh, again, Telerik gives you the source code for this, but you don't need really the source code unless you're using different versions of the uh, Telerik reporting. This is actually compiled with the latest uh, version of Telerik reporting that was released last week. Um, and you just need to have a reference to it. You don't need to, uh, to have anything else. All right. So let's go ahead and open up this, uh, the code for that and see what exactly do I need to do to make this happen. First of all, I'm going to be using the Red Grid Reporting Lite uh, DLL that comes from Telerik. And um, automatically by filling up the adapter, which the system will do for you automatically on the load of the form, these are the lines of code that you will actually need to do to make this work. I'm going to create a Red Grid report, um, give it whatever name you want, and the report itself you can actually set the uh, page size, the margins, the landscape, do whatever you want here. Uh, and finally, the most important one is saying report dot report form show, and pass the entire red grid view to it. So whatever the red grid view is showing at the at this time, whether it is um, filtering, sorting, doing whatever, once you run the report from sh uh, form show from the red grid, this is the data that's going to be passed straight to the Telerik reporting. All right, so this is a very simple line of code right there, um, and that will make it work. Of course, in real-life application, you want to create a user interface to allow end users to set all these things based on checkboxes and um, user interactions um, inside of there, okay? Right now, I'm just hard-coding everything just to show you how it works. So I'm going to compile this guy and run it one more time, and we'll see what happens when I generate the code. There is the app, okay, there is a lot of records in this guy, okay, and once I click on generate from here, you'll notice that the Telerik reporting will show up, a sample report, that's the name I gave it, and it will take a few seconds, and now it will generate, as you can see, the pages on the fly, and there is 12 pages, and everything inside of the Telerik grid has shown automatically inside of that report. Uh, the nice thing about this report, folks, is that I can actually now take this report and save it as a PDF file, as a CSV comma delimited file, as an Excel spreadsheet, uh, a rich text format, a TIFF, or a web archive. So if any of you are interested in uh, maybe sending this to a PDF, in the code itself, you don't even need to show this window. You can actually send the report to a PDF straight from the code, so you'll end up with a PDF automatically from whatever Red Grid view um, uh, is containing at that point. Okay? All right. Well, I've been uh, talking for about an hour and a half. I really want to thank everybody for uh, for being with us for the last hour and a half, and I want to open up for questions. And uh, I know I have about four people, or five people actually right now, as staff to answer your questions. Hopefully, everybody has been uh, getting their questions answered. Uh, and if anybody would like me to go through something in the next uh, half an hour or so, I'll be more than happy to go through it again or answer some questions that have not been answered already. Um, so let's take a couple of questions from there. All right, I'm uh, waiting for somebody to send me any kind of uh, questions from the staff members. Uh, by the way, folks, the, there is currently um, a lot of questions that got asked during the entire session. What I usually do with these questions is that I'm going to put all of your questions in a PDF format. Um, 
And once you actually have all the stuff in a PDF format, um, I'm going to actually answer them as well and make sure that all the questions I've got asked during the two hours, uh, you get the questions and the answer to them as well um, um, and actually make it work this way. So hopefully that will be useful to you because I know not everybody can see all the answers and the questions that got asked during the two hours. So I usually get all these questions at the end and I'm going to actually try to answer them for you in writing. Um, and make this uh, available, okay? Um, all right, there is a question here. Which namespace do I need for the Excel exporter? Let's go ahead and open up this guy. For the Excel exporter, let's be the code. Um, you only need the Teladic.data uh, to actually be able to do this. Uh, the exporter is coming from the Teladic.data. Um, and also, depending on what you're doing, really, you need to use the Teladic windcontrols.ui.export as well. Okay, so these two are very important. Data and UI.export are needed for doing that. Um, the question is, can you use reporting light with ASP.NET AJAX Red Grid? As a matter of fact, folks, you do not really need, uh, the reporting light is needed because the AJAX, ASP.NET AJAX has already that stuff built into it. Uh, we are actually needing that reporting light to mimic some things happening in the ASP.NET AJAX to happen in WinForm. So you really don't need that part if you're using ASP.NET um, AJAX. That is already built in. So this is an extra piece that uh, to be able to use uh, the exporter from inside of a WinForms Red Grid view. So that is not an issue for the ASP.NET AJAX one. Um, can you use uh, stored procedures with linked DBML? Absolutely, you can definitely do that. Remember when I actually created the DBML for uh, for the uh, for the sales order, uh, I actually dragged the table. But you can actually drag also a stored procedure if you want, and that is part feature of the DBML link to SQL that is built into um, the Microsoft technology for .NET 3.5 as well. Um, let's see if there is other questions. Can you export to XLSX2? Honestly, I have not tried it, but I will try it and I will answer your question um, in the PDF. Uh, I always try to use XLS files, but uh, the new format for 2007, I will uh, I will try that and see if it will export to it or not. Um, that would be a good thing to, to know as well. Um, Can you show how you only enable filtering for specific column, hiding the filter text box for specific columns? Hmm. Um, that would be interesting. I'm not sure actually you can do that. I mean, Todd, um, I don't know if you can actually set the filtering for a specific field or not, but maybe there is a feature. I have not used this feature before uh, for actually setting the filter visually only on a specific um, fields, but if that's the case, um, um, all right, when you say allow filtering equals to false, that will actually turn uh, filtering for all the fields um, inside of the red grid to false. I think the question was, can I actually maybe have two or three of the fields uh, or the columns inside of the grid that you can filter on and the rest you will not be able to filter on? And for that uh, question, I don't have a definitive answer for that, but I will definitely make sure to find out and I'll put it in the PDF as well when I send it, uh, send it out. And the video for that will be available for you um, as soon as possible. I'm going to actually, um, as soon as I stop the recording, I will send that video to um, to the Teleric team, and hopefully they will make it available for you as soon as possible. The PDF give me till the end of the day today, and I'll put together all the questions, and I'll send it to everybody. And I'm hoping also the Teleric will let us know what do we do with the people actually that cannot receive zip files or PDF files from the outside. I know that... Um, I got like 20% of the emails got rejected that their emails do not accept zip files or PDFs and stuff like that. So maybe you can just go ahead and download it straight from the Teleric website, video, code, and all that good stuff. All right, Todd uh, Englund from, uh, from Teleric saying that he will actually make the, uh, the downloads available on the Teleric Watch for right now. So go to telericwatch.com. Hopefully in the next few hours you'll be able to go download the source code and the PDF, and hopefully the video will be available uh, as well. All right, uh, let's see what other questions are coming in. Uh, 
Um, uh, actually, Todd is uh, passing information. Which namespace is needed for the Excel exporter? Um, I actually said already that you need actually Teldirect.data.dll and the Win Controls.doi.dll. These are the two namespaces that will need to be referenced and added to the using clause uh, for the Excel exporter to work. Okay, let's see if anybody have any other questions. Alrighty, and uh, for those uh, the the folks in the beginning that actually had a problem with the resolution, please accept my deepest apology. Um, I, I just couldn't change that resolution because the video, um, unfortunately, would have not recorded well at all. I know that might have been frustrating for some, and please, for that, accept my deepest apology. I didn't uh, mean to uh, to make this frustrating. So hopefully, uh, the, when you get the video, you will be able to get a much better view of uh, of the screen. I apology again for that. All right, so it looks like there is a lot of questions coming in about uh, exporting to PDF. Uh, exporting to PDF, like I said, once the, the, uh, the, the form itself shows up um, from the sample report, you can actually bring up the Save As and Save PDF. Of course, this, folks, can be done programmatically. I don't have the code handy with me right now, but it looks like this is important for everybody. So in the PDF, I'm going to put a few lines of code to show you right here right here how to actually uh, programmatically send the report to PDF instead of showing the form I'm gonna actually generate it as a PDF to start with so there will be no visualization of the report it will just create a PDF for you I will add that code for you in here I don't have the correct syntax for you right now but I promise um, these will it will be very simple I remember doing that actually for the uh, for the ASP.NET version of the product uh, to programmatically create the PDF and I'm sure it's going to be identical code I just need to find it and I'll add it to this example and I'll be part of the PDF when I send it back I promise There is a question coming in saying, can I hide columns and show users a column chooser similar to the Outlook grid? Um, and it definitely is definitely possible. Remember, um, you can actually hide the columns, and then you can actually maybe have a right click, bring up another form, and this form contains maybe a, a list that contains all the fields from, uh, from the specific uh, data set that is coming back, okay? Um, it's very easy to actually find out all the columns. They are a collection of columns and just show the name of them all together inside of that list box. So whenever somebody drags it or clicks on it and say add it, uh, automatically you can write the code to enable that column inside of the red grid and make it visible equal to true. So absolutely you can do that with a few lines of code as well. That will not be a big deal at all uh, to make this work. Um, the, the first answers I'm getting regarding the XLSX uh, issue, it doesn't look like uh, it works. I think it only works with XLS file. I'm going to actually uh, make sure I talk to Teller to make sure this information is correct, but as of right now, it looks that the exporting happens only with XLS files, not with XLSX files. Uh, big questions coming in, does uh, Telerik have an ASP.NET AJAX grid? And absolutely, uh, the ASP.NET AJAX grid have seen so many different revisions that is now is considered to be the strongest grid available on the web today uh, for implementing uh, uh, very flexible and very powerful and is extremely speed grids um, actually on inside of a website, uh, inside of an ASPX page. And um, if you are not familiar with ASP.NET Grid, for instance, I did a webinar last month on uh, how to do ASP.NET uh, Red Grid with AJAX, and it's available for free for you to download and take a look at the video. Uh, again, go to uh, telericwatch.com, and I believe Todd England already have a link, so you can see the two-hour video that we did with the uh, ASP.NET AJAX Grid. 
and you'll be more than uh, welcome to take a look at it and send us any questions that you have about that and um, you can send me an email I'm gonna put my email address in here Dino at falafel.com it's on the screen right there uh, if you'd like to get the source code for the red grid uh, for ASP.NET Ajax you're more than welcome to send me an email and I'll send it to you I'm not sure if the video on the Telerik watch has the code or not but if uh, if not I'll be more than happy to send it to you there's a question uh, um, um, there is uh, actually uh, a question he's saying is there a show column chooser method of the red grid view and uh, apparently there is one built into the grid itself so at runtime you can just uh, bring up the show column chooser uh, so availability in the grid at runtime will be automatic so just right click in the runtime and pick column chooser so uh, let's go ahead and try that and see how it works so if I uh, run this guy and there is the grid apparently if I right click somewhere in here um, column chooser right there so that's built in so apparently right now all the columns are showing um, and I can actually take them out and put them back in here as you can see okay there is no code to write apparently all the stuff is built in again even if that was not available folks or you wanted to look differently it is very easy to implement something like that at runtime um, so that you can actually have a list with all the different fields Telerik went to of course um, uh, excellence to make this look very nice very proper here very uh, cool looking so that you can actually come back and add the stuff anytime from the column chooser at runtime so your user can do that as well okay all right all right um, also um, um, we can actually do the red grid to uh, include the uh, the chooser so uh, Todd would like me to show you how to do that programmatically it would be pretty simple actually so I'm gonna go to uh, here go to the toolbox add a button there's my button if we put a button here the on-click event of that button will be as simple as saying red grid view one dot show column chooser so as you can see in here it's as simple as just calling the method and if I run this application now you can see programmatically I can hopefully click on this button and the chooser will show up right away okay so you can do that programmatically as well all right somebody is asking where can I get the dynamic.cs file uh, you probably do not have the PDF yet so I'm gonna go ahead and and find it for you I'm gonna put it on the screen right here let me bring up notepad up um, it will definitely be much better if you can get the PDF so it has all this information in it format font 20 and make it bold there you go that is where you can get the dynamic.cs file okay msdn microsoft.com enus bb3309.36 Okay, another question coming in is there localization support in the red grid view and the answer is absolutely um, again red grid view is based on top of the dotnet framework and uh, the dotnet framework does a very good job with localization um, so you can actually localize uh, this have a French version a German version a Chinese version whatever um, instead of your resources for the application itself and it can it can be done dynamically by you choosing which one to load or you can leave it actually for the thread culture to automatically find out which one it needs to bring up all right this is going to be uh, apparently the last question so can you add context menu to red grid view uh, of course uh, you can actually have a red menu uh, or any kind of menu if you want context menu the one comes from uh, from Telerik or from the .NET framework itself and then on the right click you can actually um, bring up your own 
context menu as well. Yes. Um, if there is something that you uh, need to see an example of, I'll be more than happy to also create a small example to show you how to add a context menu and add it to the PDF um, uh, to do that. Alrighty? All right. At this point, folks, I want to thank everybody. Thank you for your patience. I hope this was valuable to you. And if you have a couple of minutes after we close down the session, if you can actually give us your opinion uh, with a five-question survey, let us know what we did well, what we didn't do well, what would you like to see in the future. And we always try to actually make this better and better so everybody can get the maximum value out of the Telerik components. They are very powerful components, and we would like everybody to see exactly how they get used in real-life scenarios, if possible. The next uh, one will be an advanced uh, webinar. As you can see, we do one advanced and one inter introductory, and then we go back to one advanced, so we keep everybody um, interested in what we are doing. Okay? So have a great one, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.